Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our roundtable on offensive cybersecurity by AI, um, promises and pitfalls. My name is Annika Selzer, and I would like to give you a warm welcome on behalf of Professor Dr. Indra Spieker, who is the main organizer of this roundtable, um, and myself. Um, this roundtable is organized within a research project of Athene, and Athene is the national research center for um, applied cybersecurity of Germany, and it is the largest um, research center within Europe that is tangling the research on cybersecurity and privacy. Um, it is a research center of the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft or Fraunhofer Society, but it has a strong involvement of the Technical University of Darmstadt and the Goethe University of Frankfurt and the Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences. And I would like to take a moment um, to thank our funding um, parties um, to enable us to do this roundtable today, which are the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research, as well as the Hessian Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science and Arts. And as I already mentioned, um, we are organizing this roundtable within a research project, which is called Legal Framework of Offensive Cybersecurity Research. And I'm well aware that there is not like an official, well-established definition for the term offensive um, cybersecurity. And that's why I want to give you a short definition, our short definition of what we understand um, offensive cybersecurity should be. And um, to sum it up or to make it very easy, accessible, we think offensive cybersecurity is when organizations or researchers are using similar or even the same tools and methods as malicious attackers would do, but they do it for a totally different reason with a totally different aim. So on the one hand, we have malicious attackers and they are using methods and tools to well, maliciously attack organizations and um, individuals, for example, to steal data from them. And on the other hand, we have researchers offensive cybersecurity researchers who use these same or similar methods and tools to first of all understand them and get a feeling for them, what can they do, um, what targets can they um, follow up on, and then um, identify the threats and vulnerabilities that go along with those tools and methods and then derive countermeasures. So on the one hand, we have malicious attackers who want to do something bad um, to weaken IT. And on the other hand, we have the researchers who are using the same tools and methods to, um, with the aim to strengthen the IT. And as you probably already realized that when researchers are using the same tools and methods as malicious attackers would do, it leads, um, it leads to a lot of legal concerns and ethical questions that we want to um, discuss today in this roundtable. Um, the roundtable is supposed to focus on, especially on um, using artificial intelligence within offensive cybersecurity. And I would now like to hand over to Indra, who is going to um, introduce you to our panel. <laughs> So very warm welcome from me as well, and um, a grateful thanks to our two uh, researchers who are hidden in the panel here, um, and this is Caroline Plutz and Julia Esser, who were the one who organized this together with us, and there's a third colleague of ours, uh, Christoph Borchardt, who is from the criminal law side, who cannot be here today, but who can be here today, and we're super grateful for that, is our panelists. And I'll start by introducing them very, very shortly so that we'll go into the details very quickly of discussing this. This is what you're here for, but that you know what is their particular perspective and expertise, and I'll do this very classical, ladies first. Um, and I'll start with Eva. Wolf Angle, um, <laughs> or Wolf Angel, whatever you prefer. And we were just talking about the pun behind this, if you understand German at all. She's an Indian. Nice <laughs> <laughs> <say> Wolf Angel. <laughs> I like 
Um, she's an independent journalist and um, has published uh, explicitly on organizational roles in the area of cybersecurity, so she knows what she's talking about. She has a lot of background, but she also has the independence, and that was something that was important for us to invite her into this panel. I'm very grateful. She's extremely busy that she took the time to come here. Right next to her is uh, Chris Kubeka. Chris is... Um, with a company and maybe during the course of our session she will explain a little bit more what she's doing, what her competencies are there and, and what her tasks are there. So um, we were looking for someone who was um, nation state incident management and this is the area in which she is um, known that she has expertise in ethical hacking and this is what you could call offensive cyber security too and that is the ethical hacking, and this leads us back into discussions that were, at least in Germany, big in the 1990s and 2000s, where we had the so-called hacking paragraph, and a lot of the good hackers, like the Creators Computer Club, which most people in this area know, had big trouble uh, showing that it was legal what they were doing, and um, the companies who were trying to employ people like that had big trouble to protect those employees, and then we had to have workarounds. But now we're in 2024, so the world has changed, IT security has changed, and um, so this is an important perspective. This leads me to our other um, expert from the managerial side, and that's uh, George Papsis. George is um, with security, in with, sorry, Obrela Securities Industry, who provides actual cybersecurity intelligence service, and so he also is right into providing the services we are discussing from a more academic, research-oriented side. So it is important to link those two, or potentially three objectives and three perspectives here. And the idea is to do this all in a round table and then also open up to questions from the audience so that you are able to bring in the perspective that we might not have covered. And last but certainly not least, we have Johan right next to me. Um, Johan Laux is uh, presently also a researcher at the um, Oxford Internet Institute. He's also located in Berlin and also in Frankfurt a little bit. But uh, since this is an online world, we don't see much in person in Frankfurt, but rather on screen, etc. cetera. And, um, he uh, ex is working on the responsibility of regulation of and uh, regulation of new digital technologies. So cybersecurity is one of the areas um, where he links data protection research, privacy research, digital regulations, and IT security. And this is the special focus that we wanted to bring into the CPDP AI, and that is look at AI, look at privacy, and look at IT security, because our understanding in Athene is you can't do one without the other, really. And with that, Annika will start with content, and now we'll really get into the discussion. Okay, so um, my first set of questions um, is addressing especially Chris and George. And I would like to know that from your perspective, what are the most important application scenarios for AI in offensive cybersecurity? And to what extent is offensive cybersecurity practiced within your organizations? Sure. Um, what are the most important application scenarios for AI in cybersecurity or offensive cybersecurity? And then to what extent um, is offensive cybersecurity practiced within your organization? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, it's, 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 a, it's a, um, a question that I think applies um, to the world. and, and as, as, as changes happen to, to how we interact with the um, cyberspace and how things are changing in our life, I think the same applies with um, the cybersecurity market. Um, when you actually mention offensive, however, I, I would like to distinguish um, offensive from an operational defense standpoint. When we mention offensive cybersecurity from an operational security defense standpoint, it means that we take action against the attackers. So that's offensive. Um, but I, uh, there is also um, a subject of using offensive techniques to simulate um, attack vectors and profiles so that we proactively protect ourselves and strengthen our, our architectures. 
Having, having said that, I think um, AI has a massive disrupting effect to the cybersecurity market as well, both in terms of um, complexity, um, both in, as well in terms of scale. So with AI, both offend, offenders and defenders can actually perform um, activities into um, a scale which had no, with no, uh, with unparalleled proportions than previously. So we can now execute offensive attacks um, and um, simulate offensive exercises into a larger scale. We can analyze the results from those offensive exercises faster. And to a big extent, we can automate uh, those offensive playbooks and also uh, automate the decisions as well. And this is the most critical part, the decisions, because the difference with AI, with everything else that we had in the previous, uh, previously, is the ability for AI to take decisions. So what is distinguishing AI from machine learning, analytics, or whatever you have heard before is the decision part. AI can make decisions. Now, whether we authorize those decisions or we autonomously give the right to those systems and machines to take decisions, that's, of course, something which is configurable, optional, and uh, to some extent is, is possible and um, required. But if I, 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 I have to give an answer, I think that with AI now can execute uh, activities in a larger scale, we can address much more complexity into our anal in anal analyzing data, and we, we can also engage AI into remediation, and, um, and, and that's also um, perhaps even more important. Leveraging the decision-making authority uh, and capabilities of the, the AI um, technology. So when I look at uh, how I utilize uh, current AI architecture as an ethical hacker, uh, dealing with nation state types of things. One of the areas that I concentrate a lot on is the analysis portion. Now obviously it needs a bit of training when it comes to the cybersecurity portion or to the privacy portion so that you can fine tune things to see if you can actually find a vulnerability that you can exploit, whether that is the cybersecurity side or the privacy side, right? Um, so I think the analysis is very, very important when it comes to large language models. But I do want to stress it needs to be properly trained. Otherwise, you're throwing some, you know, questionable material at the wall and then expecting all of your processes to operate off of whatever sticks to the wall. That doesn't work. Um, one of the ways that I use uh, various forms of AI in my everyday uh, work is not only the analysis portion after I've trained it. So I can take um, information from a website. I did this a couple of months ago. Um, the Guardian came out with a report that a nuclear facility called Sellafield in the UK had experienced some cybersecurity issues. The UK government denied everything. Um, I had happened to have been at Sellafield myself as a lecturer for GCHQ, so I knew exactly what had been going on. So I was able to uh, find, I, I could take recommendations going, hey, my, uh, I call it my hacktress, GPT, because I like to go by that moniker. And I go, uh, could you give me a, a, a brief list of uh, websites that can give me historical information on a domain? So I could then look back at what used to be the nuclear facility called Sellafield's domain, find their previous website, which they had just changed around a month before the big cybersecurity announcement uh, was made in The Guardian. I could then take the HTML code directly from their previous website, put it in, and my Hactress GPT that had been trained could tell me five critical issues where I could plant my own malicious code onto one of their logon pages. Ages. So I thought that was pretty good for a very quick analysis and it saved me a lot of time because usually I'll have to go through about five tools manually to do a lot of that. So I was able to give that information to the journalist who requested it going out, yeah, here's all the stuff, 
here's everything from the various tools and here's the analysis and here's how quickly I could do it. And so it saved me tons of time. Now when I want to add on to, for example, the same types of tools that an attacker will use, well you can weaponize any tool that uh, is in existence. But if I'm gonna use those same exact tools and I wanna make a tweak against the system, I'll take the code from say something called GitHub, I'll pop it into my handy Hacktress with a code analyzer and go, hey, I need to improve this. So let's step through this code and improve it. And it's like an accelerant. I'm like an arsonist and I know not only how to set the fire, but I have every accelerant available to me. And that's how I use it in my everyday life. That's impressive. <laughs> Thank you very much for these insights. Um, now, you already talked a little bit um, about the interconnection in between IT security and privacy. Um, but let me um, follow up by asking, are you processing personal data while carrying out offensive cybersecurity? And if so, um, what measures are in place in your organizations to ensure compliance to data protection law? Because it's a bit different way of handling data processing. You, um, maybe you don't even know that you are going to be processing personal data before you really do. So what are the challenges and how are you facing them within your organization? So there are a couple of things that I always put into a contract when I have an engagement. One of those is the stopping point of how to handle information where I think that someone has already broken into the system. It then becomes recording a crime, collecting evidence. There has to be a legal apparatus and a framework to go, guess what, I found someone in your system, this is now a legal matter, we need to uh, change this from a regular engagement to a criminal matter. And the same thing can happen with privacy as well, depending on where the data uh, has been leaked or exposed or what have you, because there's also that obligation. Depending on where you are carrying out these tasks, there can also be criminal liabilities, such as in the Netherlands, if you mishandle uh, private data and you don't report it properly. So that's also a stop point, whether it be by regulation on one side or by potential criminal activity on the other side. And those two things have to be very important for contracts because I love playing with code, I'm not a lawyer. And I don't wanna to go to jail, so. Thank you very much. So, um, Johan and Eva, um, do you see AI as a driver of cybersecurity attacks? And how do you feel the attack landscape is changing? I think we already heard that the landscape definitely is changing and we see a lot of more quantity over quality, but then again, if I understand you correctly, there is also a lot of quality going on. You can improve um, the code over hackers so easily. So how is the landscape changing? I love the story you uh, Switch. I enjoy it much more to use yes. this one. Yeah, is it good? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs> I love the story about your, I, I would like to know much more maybe afterwards about your personal GPT and how you train that. Um, yes, but uh, I mean, I see, I think we see, we see both. Um, quantity is of course growing because like phishing emails and all these things are much easier to write now. Um, then we hear many things about um, um, fake I mean, we had CEO fraud, we had this already before generative AI, but now I heard about um, the CEO calling with their real vo real voice, and still it's not the CEO telling people whatever, uh, transfer all the money to this and that point. And I, I don't know, so I haven't fact-checked that, but I heard that there are first attacks already successful that way. Um, I'm not, I personally am not very um, worried about this one because I feel like, um, we had this before, right? CEO fraud has been working without AI too. So um, I think we, maybe AI even helps us or the, the new threat or now that everyone is talking about this new threat helps us to, um, to be more cautious or to, um, to turn on our critical thinking if our CEO calls us and asks us to whatever, send money to anywhere. Um, so I, th I am not sure if this quantity thing is a real problem because there was a huge quantity of these kind of cheaper um, cyber attacks before. Um, another thing that worries me much more is this: is the more sophisticated use of generative AI for cyber attacks. 
Um, I met um, a white hat hacker or ethical hacker, I mean, there are different um, names for that. Um, maybe he's even just a hacker, <laughs> but he's not, <laughs> he has not, no criminal motivations. But he, he has, he made kind of a proof of concept how to use um, ChatGPT in that case um, via the API to write a malware that is not um, detectable anymore with all the classical methods we know because this malware is changing its nature all the time. So it's using the API um, from OpenAI um, and changing from code to language to code to language. And that means because AI is, is um, that the outcome is, is different every time, even if you ask ChatGPT the same question 10 times, you get 10 different answers. And this is how this works. Um, so the code and the language description of this um, malware is changing um, every single time. And that's why it's not detectable all um, at all. And um, yeah, he told me and my colleague this is just to make people aware of that and to um, make sure that we can start defend ourselves against these kind of attacks. Uh, but at the same time, a German BSI wrote a um, month later that they still don't have a clue or nobody has a clue how to, um, uh, how to, how to defend against these kind of attacks. And this feels to me that this might be dangerous, that it's now out in the open already. So this is maybe a question for our panel if, um, if we define offensive cybersecurity in, in, in your way, so that is, is using the same methods criminals could use. Um, maybe we should think of um, if this could help criminals the other way around. I mean, we know stories from, from history, right, where we saw that um, cyber weapons from whatever nation state actors, for example, were, um, we don't know how, but uh, criminals got access to them and used them for really um, serious and really expensive attacks um, around the world. And this is this is again, I mean, the, the same question, but on a, another level, right? Should we, how should we make others aware of these new threats? Is it, is it a good idea to put them, whatever, to GitHub where criminals can just copy and paste them and use them? Um, is, does this help um, defense or is it maybe even more dangerous if it, because it's out there? So, sorry, that was lengthy, but. <laughs> Thank right. you so much. Um, we were just wondering if maybe you would like to react to this from a more practical point of view. I, I think it's one of these things, like you were describing a, um, a hacker, we gotta take that term back, it's a good term. Um, basically uh, using a technique of what we would call like polymorphic uh, with a mix between you know chunks and data and then also language. And I think that that's a, a really novel way and we have to think about these types of things. And one of the disappointing things that I found when um, OpenAI opened their store um, I had already, all right, I will preface this, I am single, I might not have a life. So I already had about 85 GPTs on four different platforms that I'd built. And I was like, oh, let me check out this new store. And I did a survey um, of 100 GPTs up on the OpenAI store the day after it opened to the public. And only one of them um, had actually included any sort of privacy statement or security statement, only one. And I was able to utilize, you know, language uh, to be able to just uh, then um, talk my way into getting all of the intellectual property and any other data that uh, they had been collecting off of it. So it was basically 100 out of 100 with just a, a, a silly little message saying, you shouldn't be asking that. Let me ask it a different way. Um, and there wasn't a lot of guidance. So if you look on OpenAI's um, website, when you're looking for their privacy or their security information, for privacy, it's rather vague. And it says, oh, it meets with this if you have um, higher paid tier accounts. They won't use your information. Well, it's not that explicit when you're just using it either for free or even the 20 euro a month account. Um, so it's very vague statements. There's not a lot of security settings. There's not a lot of, hey, if you're gonna put your stuff up on OpenAI, and you're probably going to do this for investors. Here's how you actually hide all that intellectual property so someone doesn't come by and go, I'm just inventing the Hacktress GPT-2 um, and getting money for it myself. So there's this uh, disconnect between it's great that they want to innovate, but the problem is 
we don't have a way to solve for the, the tool in case it gets dangerous. And I'm not sure how many of you saw, maybe in the news or what have you, but early last year, OpenAI actually put out a job offer, 500K a year, for a human being to physically kill OpenAI in case it got out of control. Did any of you see that job offer? It was also on LinkedIn. It was an official job offer. Um, so I think you bring up a very good point where we are moving forward, it's accelerating things, and 500K for kills, a human kill operator, wait a second. Um, so we do need to take these things seriously because whew, I'm telling you, I don't want to be here. Well, actually, you know what? I don't have to worry about saving for retirement now. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Well, I, th I think there is, um, I fully agree with uh, your statements from a privacy standpoint, but from, uh, from um, a professional and um, as, a, as a service provider, we, we do deliver, let's say, simulation um, offensive services, as you call them. And we think this is the first, one of the first areas that um, AI, AI's contribution and uh, will be huge in a sense that we can now create uh, autonomous ethical hacking systems that can literally replace uh, human labor. So um, we already are testing, let's say, complete automated offensive um, uh, exercises powered by uh, AI-driven bots that can execute simulation or offensive exercises in a huge scale with no human interference. Imagine that ethical hackers that are now very rare to find will be completely replaced. Maybe the senior ones will actually migrate from an execution standpoint, ethical hacking, pure ethical hacking, code creator or code developer to a strategist. Because the cybersecurity game now, uh, it becomes a more strategic game. When resources are, let's say, unlimited, both for the offensive but also on the defensive sides, strategy becomes substantial and, and the differentiating part, which is not the case today, because today, to defend ourselves, we add more resources, more hardware, more software. And the more we add, the more expensive it becomes for the attackers to, 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 to use that as the target. So when, when this is not so important anymore, and we have AI, uh, both on the defensive but also on the offensive side, you understand that this now becomes a strategy game, and this is when the human beings actually come back. So I think this is the, the type of things that we will see in the very near future. And, um, uh, but I fully agree on the privacy, which is uh, a very key issue as well. Um, yeah, um, I think from, from, to add a legal point of view to the question about um, uh, how AI might be changing the landscape is I think if you're taking a regulatory <coughs> law perspective, you're kind of concerned that more actors will be able to, to come up with more sophisticated attacks. So, um, and for lawyers, it's not unimportant to uh, be able to attribute to the, uh, the attack to someone. So you need to know who you're defending against because that also kind of moves the, uh, um, yeah, the, the threshold of what you're allowed to do. Um, and I think that is one of the concerns that we'd like to add just to, to yes, everything that said before. Um, that the attribution problem that's already there anyways might get even more complicated or will definitely or is getting more complicated now um, and I am um, yeah that's the stuff that lawyers are <laughs> concerned about I think yeah I, I think I, I completely agree with you and uh, when, when, I'm, I'm sorry I'm just jumping in um, that's just that's just like that yeah uh, thank you so I just I just I had some notes to discuss this if anyway so just brother thank you for that so if, if, as we evolve into that model, as I, as I explained, and we have autonomous machines and systems and bots and you name it as much as, and as, like, as you like, then we have the risk of, um, of responsibility and accountability. Because when you give the decision-making authority to a system to actually perform simulating exercises, to what extent this thing stops? Uh, to what extent, what's the scope uh, what if, he get, if it gets access to privacy data? What if it, if it actually confronts uh, 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 criminal material, 
as you very well underlined. Um, what if by accident it causes damages, collateral damages, civilians not to have access, hospitals to be out of line and disconnected, uh, critical infrastructure to be uh, not available anymore. So a human being can have that training maybe and um, because the decision is always human. But when you assign that decision to a, to a system, that, that needs to be framed, that, that needs to be controlled and maybe regulated as well. And that's the, 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 critical, the, the critical path at this stage and where we are. Um, I think this is on. Yeah, so basically what, um, what I do at Oxford is um, um, to research human oversight, which is a norm in the AI Act that certain high-risk AI systems need to have some inbuilt human control that we don't automate uh, blindly every decision. And um, now when we think about AI systems that are used in cybersecurity where you need an AI system to even be able to, to counter attacks or to, to do this kind of exploratory work that you're doing, uh, the question is, where do you get those human overseers from? It's one thing to, um, to, to regulate as the EU likes to do it and say, oh, we're gonna put human overseers in there. They're, by the way, there to, um, to, um, to, to uh, allow um, or, or to oversee the safety of the system, but also to defend values and, and, and make sure that fundamental rights are being protected. So my, my immediately when you talk about automating, I'm thinking, oh wow, that's something that the EU really cares about when we're talking about AI systems that are used um, in, um, that we normally talk about when you talk about like generative AI uh, outside of a cybersecurity uh, context. We're very certain that, um, yeah, uh, uh, um, that the AI system might be uh, the thing we're scared of. But now in cybersecurity, we need an AI system also to defend uh, ourselves. Uh, but where do you take the human uh, overseers where in an organization that you, that you might run? Who, who are the people you might think will be able to have also the kind of skills, not just on a technical basis, but also who are ethically trained um, to then implement uh, uh, the kind of human oversight that we want uh, for, for AI. Can I jump in on here? Um, a few years ago, I published a piece which I called Systemic Digitalization, which is exactly the idea behind that. And that is we're living and thinking in systems, but human beings are not good in thinking in systems. We're thinking bilateral. And in a system, you have many different compounds and you have many different authors of those compounds. If you think of platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And when you're mentioning that you have a hospital, then a hospital is not running on one software, but it is running on numerous softwares which are included in numerous pieces of hardware. And if we add AI, then we have some open AI, and I don't mean the open AI, open AI, but we have some AI which is openly out there. We have an AI which might be developed for particularly this purpose, which is interconnected. You mentioned code and language as being interesting. And I would like to add to this really is, how do you assure under conditions like those in a systematic approach that you have control, that you can actually attribute responsibility to someone, which is, a criminal law question, but it is even more so a regulatory question um, because we are talking in this this past days, and I, I can't hear it anymore. In these past two years, we've been talking AI regulation back and forth, but we never raised really the question of who is in charge and who do we really address. We're talking about users, we're talking about developers, we're talking about data subjects, and we don't really know how we we address those are that are being judged, whose data is being used, blah 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 blah. So my question to you as the practitioners, but also to you as the insiders in, in, from different perspectives would be, how do we actually create a system that is attributable, that is acting responsible in a legal sense so that I can have someone who's pushing the button, the off button? And the funny thing is when you mentioned the 500K, I was thinking, that's not much money. <laughs> I mean, who earns 500K? Look at CEOs in the United yeah. States. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not really optimistic that this is possible to have um, the real human oversight about automated decisions. Um, if you look into the nature of AI, is, um, and this is already a, a challenge that is um, built in the EU AI Act as well, that this, this idea of explainability doesn't work, right? So this, um, 
sophisticated AI systems like we have them now are not, it's, it's not, so researchers told me it's not even possible to build in a real um, explanation or a system that helps us to understand how they and why they decide um, the way they do. Um, because it's, yeah, it's not possible, it's not, it's not in a part of the architecture. Um, and for me, this feels like this is already, uh, that's it, right? I mean, how can we use them? We, we like to use them because they are good in, in these kind of decisions. They are good in uh, making decisions on, on big amounts of data. But um, at the same time, as, as, long, as soon as we cannot um, understand these decisions anymore, it's, the question is, uh, for, what, for what cases should we use them at all? Because I, I would say as, as everything, as, a, as far as I heard so far from, from all kind of experts, is it's not possible. I would counter that by saying it is possible. So you have uh, two different layers. Uh, and I'm just using OpenAI uh, as an example because that was the one pointed out by the EU legislation, there goes the sign, um, as one that uh, met with a variety of uh, privacy legislation and regulations. So you've got the platform of OpenAI, uh, what it's been trained on, what its uh, base capabilities are. Then you have uh, your own GPTs, whether that's in the GPT store or your own stuff. And in that descriptor is what some of the, we'll say, analysis and decision making is done. Now, at least when I set up a system, I'm very explicit in spelling that out so that if I'm ever audited, which I expect to be, in the future, because of the recent AI legislation, um, I then detail what each one is. And then when I'm setting up and testing the system, I also uh, put in clarifying statements so that as I'm training the system, as I'm working with the system in the beginning, it clarifies and tells me exactly what it understands versus what I'm putting in with the prompt or versus what I'm putting it in with the data. Now. I might do this because I like to comment on my code and comment on my stuff so I can rebuild things. And I also have no life. But I expect to be audited because I've worked so often with so many lawyers. Um, so I think OpenAI has their own decision making stuff in their own little black box. But then once you build upon that, you absolutely can describe, go, this is what the decision, the analytics, and what I intended for its use are. And you can actually detail that so it can be audited in the future. So I would politely disagree that there are possibilities, but it takes additional effort to make sure that you're documenting it. But how do you know that the system is telling the truth if you ask for a reason behind a decision? So. Um, as I'm, I'm starting up the system, I'm checking it because I know that it can hallucinate. Um, that problem was more prevalent in the beginning when this kind of stuff came out. Like, uh, for example, <laughs> I was trying to update some of my internet links, and I was like, oh, could you search the internet and do whatever? And it gave me a link saying that I had been hired as a security consultant for Huawei in Canada. I've never worked for Huawei in my life. Uh, of course, the link went to a dead link, but I thought that that was curious. So um, what I do is I force test statements in as I'm working randomly to make sure that it's not hallucinating. And if it is, I can then start to measure how far it's deviated off of and then get it to clarify and pull it back and make it explain. But I put in tests, just like a programmer would with unit tests. You have to do the same thing with AI. I jump in again. Um, one of the early AI things um, I learned from a colleague was uh, that HIV treatment nowadays and has been done with AI for a number of years. The reason is that the HIV is very um, volatile and has lots of mutations and you don't just get one medication but you get a cocktail. So no medical doctor is able to perform that anymore. It's done completely and it's state of the art both in the United States and in Europe to do it that way. So what you just described, see that the system hallucinates is impossible because there's nobody who has the knowledge to do that. So how would you control for that? Well, um, just let me that add that. I think we're talking about a situation in which we have a, had AI for years and years, but now we have the large language models and we have ChatGPT and it's there for everyone, et cetera, et cetera. So we're now in a new dynamics, yeah. I think. 
And um, we're talking about a dynamics which has been going on for one and a half years in that sense. If I think about this in five years, we're not talking about a system which has undergone two versions, three versions, something like this, but we have seen I just read this morning that the Times, the Springer um, publishing company, they've all agreed to sell basically the content of their archives to ChatGPT, which means all of a sudden you have a humongous additional information in the system. So how would you control for that? There's no chance you could have the alternative AI running with the same normative standards and see whether it really has the same solution when you think of two million more steps five years from now. Mm -hmm. well, actually, um, a lot of the development when it comes to large language models is uh, done by humans. Uh, so there's a, a few services where if you're a developer, you can actually um, train some of the back end of some of these uh, GPT products. So I've got an opportunity to play with some of those systems. And what they'll do is they'll give you, uh, you'll have one prompt and then you'll have five to 10 different GPTs from different providers showing you the different answers. And that's part of the testing process and you can see what hallucinates and what isn't. Um, or what's correct or what goes completely off scope or what have you. Now that is the type of testing that is done in the background that you and I don't typically see when we grab one of these subscriptions. So they're actually already doing that in the background. Yeah. Just very, and then I'll stop and then we'll go back to cybersecurity issues. Um, <laughs> but um, that's the interesting point. You're saying you can check. Yeah. You have five different models and they offer you four to one. So according to the functionalities of AI, I would say probability, 80%. So the four are right, the one is wrong. What if all four of them hallucinated and you don't have the superior knowledge to find out? If I'm in a system based of probability and correlation, then that is something which is problematic because if they all do the same mistake, then I continue to, to scribe within the system this mistake and I continue to build on this and you have huge path dependencies. So there's a, a researcher, I believe it was an Italian chap, uh, it's basically uh, the devil's advocate algorithm, which is specifically for this problem. And if I can remember his name, I can get you the research papers because I had this question myself late last year and then I found a bunch of his research on ResearchGate, which really explained it quite well. And I was like, why didn't I think of that? That's pretty smart, but there's actually the research, and I just call it the de devil's advocate algorithm, which is what you're describing. But he's got a much better name for it. It sounds much cooler. Yeah, yeah. I want to have a tool, please, when you yes. find it. Yes. Um, is this where, yeah, no. Um, when we come back to cybersecurity, I was wondering, because I had this similar experience when I checked, um, as, at first, um, now we have this um, personal GPTs. You can build yourself with ChatGPT, and many of them are uh, just public from from other people. And before that, you had these plugins. And I had a similar experience that I try to find out what are they doing, right? Are they stealing my data? If, if they, if if I interact with them, can they maybe spy on my computer? It's it's not easy. It's it's not even possible to find out. And um, then I tried to find out who is behind them. So they had to. Um, add one like um, like a website. You could click on a website, but most of them were just there was nothing on it, or just um, it really it looked like scam. So most of those um, institutions who who built the first um, ChatGPT plugins and and now the GPTs um, are really strange institutions, or they don't care, right? Maybe they just don't want to make a nice website or something. But for me, it was really not possible to find out if I can trust them, and then. Around me, all the people were, well, I now can just upload a PDF and it tells me what's in there. Or I can upload my thoughts and it makes a nice presentation out of it. And people just do it. <laughs> and this is what I really think is their cybersecurity totally underestimated by, by everyone, right? And now we have this Microsoft Copilot thing where all the organizations and companies just, just use it. And at the same time, BSI and others have their warnings, right? As soon as, as those systems have um, access to the internet, and they have to have access to the internet in order to be to be useful, right? Um, and as long as they have this, they can, yeah, they can do whatever they want in the background, and it's hard for yourself to even find out. So you open all the doors we we try to close, and this I think is really amazing to see. And I was wondering why people don't. Are, are not more cautious or, or more 
sensible at, at all to, to think of these things. And then, of course, the next question is, is, are there solutions, right? How can we protect, be protected and still use AI in a, in a way that, it's, that it helps us? Yeah, maybe yeah. Um, let me take the chance Can I give to uh, an oh, answer sorry. to this? Go ahead. I, I think we, we have two questions, two, uh, two discussions here. Number one is a technical discussion, whether we can control AI or, or not. That's, that's the challenge here. Okay? Some people say yes, some people say no. But that applies to everybody. I mean, it, we have to see the problem from a different angle. You go to a doctor today, it's a human being, and you ask a question, and uh, a prescription, or you ask him you know, to tell you things about your health. Why do you trust the doctor? You trust a doctor because the doctor is certified. There is a university that says this is a doctor. You ask other people about him, and there is a transaction between him and you. That is exactly what is going to happen with AI. We're going to have AI uh, regu a regulation or, or a framework, a universal one, a global one, or maybe regional or, or, or European, that every AI has to be registered legally, following a process, it must be audited, controlled, and we need, the, and, 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 and the, the, the thing will follow the same process. Then we, we, can, we will also have malicious AIs and, 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 and legit ones, as we have with human beings. And this lady here can do a legit work in the morning and in the, in the night can do a, a very bad work. <laughs> why, why AI is so different? It's just not regulated yet. So we can regulate AI, we can have AI authority, or we can have AI systems that actually register AIs or bots, and they can also identify, detect unauthorized ones. We can have regulation to pursue the owners or the developers of, so, of such codes, and we can also apply software elements that ensure that there is a recording subsystem. So every AI, Whatever they do, it must be recorded. How can we evaluate the, 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 the quality and the integrity of that recording system? It's a technical issue. It can be solved. But regulation-wise, we can apply, we can enforce a recording system. The same way that we apply this to every other software. And we also, as users, whenever we interact with any other system in the world today, there is recording activity, recording user activity. And that is already used. This is something that we have been doing now for the last 30 years. It's not something new. So it's not as, as complex as you think, but there is, we have to follow the same process. We have to follow our, our, our experience. And, and, and I think that's the way. Uh, I'll just add, um, if any of you have flown on a plane and heard of a thing called a black box, that's exactly what it's doing. So artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s. It started in Japan. We've been using AI to do automation in aviation and in space and so forth. And that logging is the black box. Um, spacecraft go up and down all the time, and because of turbulence, automatically, through automation and early AI, can land. Uh, in case a pilot is incapacitated. And the telemetry data, the user information, the communications that go back and forth, that is all recorded and logged in a black box. And that's all using AI. We're just in another generation of AI. Not, 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 on, not only that, but in AI, and given the capabilities that, that we now unlock, we can actually monitor the AI engines on a real-time basis. And whenever they engage on illegal, on illegal actions, we can immediately interfere. So in endless possibilities, but we, we need not to scare, not to be scared, not to... Um, just, uh. um, this leads me to my set of questions, actually. Um, and uh, one of them is, we have AI regulation now. Would we need a cybersecurity AI regulation? Because I don't see much of that mentioned in the AI regulation as it is right now. We have the classical conflicts, I think. Um, what if AI is practical but not forbidden because it's not a high-risk system, but it is an open door to cybersecurity? So what's your opinion on that? Mm. Well, my, my opinion is against regulation. 
we have to start to sandbox something which is new. We cannot just straight up go regulate that. We need to sandbox it. So first step for me is sandboxing AI systems and use existing regulation and law to confront them, like the, uh, criminal law or, or, or existing legal frameworks that exist. And we do not have to come with new. But we need to sandbox it for a, for, a, for, a matter, for a matter of time so that we actually know what to regulate. Okay? So, of course, cybersecurity should be part of that regulation because it's, it's a system. It's, 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 a, it's part of the cyberspace. So cybersecurity, uh, it, it's, it's uh, inevitable. Yeah, um, so if you look at the AI Act, or when you look at the AI Act, um, for high-risk systems, for high-risk AI systems, uh, it explicitly mentions cybersecurity, but then there's not much in it. And very typical for the AI Act, uh, the actual content gets outsourced to more technical standards like uh, uh, norms. And in this case, it's the Cyber Resilience Act um, that has been, I think, passed in April this year. It's going to be published in June. And there, the language immediately gets also more technical. And I think that is one of the core problems with regulating, um, that we, while we now have, in, in Europe, we have the AI Act, which applies um, to all kinds of AI systems. We might put all the um, normative language in it, but then what it actually means when you're applying or using a concrete AI system that uh, is much less clear. Uh, there's much less normative guidance from, uh, from, from the laws, from the regulations. And, but that doesn't mean that there is not normative decisions uh, th that you must make. So, for example, if you, if you apply... Um, an, a, an AI system uh, in, in, in cybersecurity and defense, you still make uh, risk judgments, like which risks you are still willing to take. For example, you want to automatically shut down the electricity for a certain part of whatever operation you're defending. That includes some risk and that you're willing to take. But that decision is highly normative. Uh, it can affect ethical values, um, legal, legal rights, uh, but that is not made in the act, of course, because it's way too broad. And I think that is one of the big problems that I see in the field, <coughs> that we push down a lot to a technical level because they are technical questions, but then they, they get out of view. And, and, and getting around this problem is extremely hard. Um, and yeah, I think that's where we are right now and how to get out of it. I don't know yet. <laughs> Um, I, I always say don't don't um, make don't think of regulation too small. I think we have already uh, many interesting things as well in the AI Act as in in the um, GDPR. Um, but yeah, but but I'm not a legal expert, so for me it's it's hard to say. But what I see, hard to say if we need more. But what I see, I, or I feel like a lot of the problems are already in there. Um, but what I observe, um, even with those regulations, is that there's this. Um, conflict in cybersecurity versus data protection, that it's often, of course, and this is this escalates with AI, of course, that it's, um, of course, interesting from a cybersecurity perspective to collect as much data as possible. Um, and I had uh, different researches in the past about uh, systems, cybersecurity systems for big companies, um, which collected just everything they could. They even had some, some companies offered a system, and now, funnily, this is bad, guys. Was it? Who offered this? A system that makes a screenshot every 30 seconds of your screen? What was this? Was in the, the discussion a few days ago? Recall? It's Microsoft, right? Yeah. This is this is back now. <laughs> and similar systems I saw in, in cyber for cybersecurity reasons, right? Where company they they offered a company to to make this active. Of course, there's always this consent thing. But if you are um, employed by a company and you want to keep your job, maybe you, this is not totally free consent. Um, and they said, you could just make the screenshot every 30 seconds and then you can um, re-evaluate uh, evaluate, um, risks. And of course, um, by coincidence, you could evaluate even if this person is doing their job well and if they're working very efficiently or if they don't. And of course, these surveillance thing are always, things are always interesting too for companies. And I saw many examples where this was totally mixed, right? That, um, they said, we use this for security reasons, but in fact, they use it for surveillance. Um, and to see this, uh, this recall thing now coming back from Microsoft, really, that, that worries me. I think these are the things that, that will be dangerous. And I'm not sure if, yeah, how, f even if we now have GDPR um, and the AI Act, if there is not 
if, if this is if, if companies don't find their way around them, right? Like saying, well, this is consent, or we need this for security reasons, and there's been so many examples in the past where this already went wrong. Um, so I think this this can be dangerous in the future, even more dangerous with AI. Follow up question on this. Um, and it also relates a little bit to this systematic digitalization approach that we have big systems uh, that we need to control. And um, the way you described how you construe new cyber attacks, um, my question is, would it make sense to stop using all the same AIs and decentralize? And all of a sudden, we'd have small insulas and they'd be protected just because they're too small to be, or, or you'd have so many that, of course, there's a probability that at a certain time this will be attacked. But if I have everybody use the Microsoft system, blah, 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 everybody use ChatGPT as one plugin, um, then if I'm able to hack myself into that and now the unethical hacking um, would decentralization be the way to go, which is more costly? But at the same time, it might also make us think more about security and safety. And do we really need this type of use? Well, I'm a big believer in there shouldn't be any companies, especially technology companies, that are too big to fail. Uh, about a week and a half ago uh, came out a news story that uh, Google uh, mistakenly wiped out and almost completely wiped out a big pension fund. And luckily, that big pension fund didn't back up 100% of their data to their Google system, but actually had a different backup, luckily. So they were able to restore. So Google almost wiped out one of the world's largest pension funds um, because of data mismanagement, configuration change, you know, whatever. Um, so if you're only going for using one particular technology, I think it was mentioned previous that uh, there had been, um, the NSA got hacked and their tools got leaked uh, a few years back, and uh, those tools got misused, and a lot of those tools were focused on Microsoft uh, systems. Now, Microsoft is a big market provider, so if I'm an attacker and I'm looking at frequency analysis, where am I going to uh, look at for my prime target? Uh, well, the market where people use that particular piece of software application system, whatever, the most. I'm not going to look for a niche one, unless there's a very specific reason why I'm looking for a niche provider. So I like the idea of decentralizing because also from a business point of view, you never know if that provider is going to double their prices next year or suddenly they turn really, really evil. So I, I like the decentralized part personally and it, it can help with the cybersecurity portion to a certain extent. And we do want to give the audience, and we're very happy that all of you came here. It's a long way to go, and the coffee is not for free here. Um, what? We'd like to give you all the opportunity to ask questions to the panel. So if there are any, we still have a number of cards which we would like to our panelists, and we appreciate that it's been so active so far that we don't want to exclude you. So if there is anything, mm, go ahead, please. And we'll have to pass the mic to you. I'm sorry. Um, Maybe it's true. Maybe you're in your script. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. They, they, they say you can. They say it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I mean, the room is smaller. <laughs> um, here it sounds as if you were not really translating. But if you are. Yes, I mean, the room is small enough. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Ah. <laughs> wow. I, okay. I thought the green light meant it worked. Um, um, so uh, at CPDP, there's been many discussions for many years about whether personal data should be allowed to be transferred to third states. And um, uh, we have the Schrems cases and all these things. So my question is for training AI, for doing the cybersecurity that you've been talking about, um, if if there was strict enforcement of no exports, no transfers of personal data, how much would that affect or not affect 
the ability to train AI, and the ability to do the cybersecurity that you all are discussing. Well, it's pretty rare to be able to keep all of your data inside one location. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, recently published their own privacy regulations where they stipulated that all the data must remain in Saudi Arabia. Um, that's that's going to be pretty difficult. Um, it, it's more like, a, what, what's the English term, a pie-in-the-sky dream, right? When I see pigs flying, that'll be the day that you can keep all of your data in one location and keep it nice and safe. Um, so, you know, you can have uh, data moving around, but depending on where it's moving around, it might not actually pose a risk. Um, but then you also have to address the legal frameworks, like uh, with SHREMS. The EU no longer has uh, the EU-US privacy shield. Uh, that went away, what, two and a half years ago, I think, uh, legally. Um, but what do you do to make up for that? You still want training data. Uh, companies are still going to want training data. I remember a few years back, I was at the all-party parliamentary group on artificial intelligence at the House of Lords, what a long title, where they were basically calling out China for using training data that was from stolen data at the House of Parliament because it was available data. Um, so there's also the sticky question of, uh, you might not use that data, but someone else might because their ethics are a bit different than yours as well. So how does that also come into discussion? Uh, we might uh, go, hey, this is what we need to do from a more Western standpoint, but how does that also close off the global South? Or how does that affect their ability to be equal players on the market as well? So it's like, you can restrict, but what other consequences is that going to have? Do, other, do others have... Are others aware of effects on cybersecurity or risks of cybersecurity if you localize IP addresses, you localize MAC addresses, things like that? Uh, well, I, I completely disagree with data residency regulations, to be honest, because we've, we've been addressing those regulations uh, given our presence in many countries around the world. We don't see any benefit out of that. And um, I think it's contradicting to what the world is evolving as we speak. The, 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 the thing that we're actually experiencing is the creation of cyberspace. And then we actually, this cy cyberspace is, is a new, is a new uh, territory, um, like the air, like the land, like the sea, like the space. Cyberspace is a new territory. And, and, and the difference with that is that it, it cannot be, uh, there are no borders. You cannot apply borders to cyberspace. You cannot say, we are present in Saudi Arabia, for example, and there is um, data residency issues are very strict and everything. And I've been explaining to regulators that you cannot actually limit data to the geographical borders of any country. It's impossible to do that. And by doing that, you're actually limiting yourself compared to the other states around the world. Because if you are a small country, you have a small set of data to protect, and you cannot actually use any other. Now, for example, in the states, there are no regulations in between the states. And the, the data can be anonymized and used for private and proprietary purposes. And the effect and the, and the value from processing huge amounts of data coming from, uh, from patients, from medical records, for example, and being able to assess the data uh, and apply analytics and machine learning or AI on top of that data gives huge advantages to the country. Uh, but I think, I think that that is not a country or, or a European regulation. It has only to be addressed by a global thing. There, there, there has to be a global state of mind to address privacy and do not limit that or regulate that and restrict that to country and geographical barriers. I would very much applaud that, only that I'm talking in 2024. And what we're observing is a world which is highly divided and which is drifting apart. We see that democracies are at stake. We see that there's a lot of false and fake news out. We see that there are a lot of different interests. So we're coming back to the normative values. And I wouldn't even speak of the normative values of the West because there are in concerns of data protection, just NSA, very different settings in the United States and in Europe. So I would think in a perfect visionary world, yes, but I doubt that we really 
be doing our systems a good job if we were handling it so openly and so widely. And um, I'm just saying this because fortunately they put me on not as a moderator but as a speaker, so I'm taking the privilege of the double roles here. Um, but we had a couple of people who were raising hands, so um, I'll pass on yes, to you. Uh, well, interesting discussions, thanks very much. I mean, my question is very much related to the evidentiary issues, especially with regards to AI and cybercrime. It has been mentioned that some of these tools have been actually being used by criminals, criminals that are obtaining those tools on the darknet, you know, warm GPT, fraud GPT, they might all be familiar to you. So how, what, and this is a question for the technical people, how can we ensure that actually the data that is behind the creation of that specific deepfake could actually attribute to someone who uses it to perpetrate crime in a specific jurisdiction? And how could you make the belief the judges that are going to resolve the case to rely on that specific evidence? Well, on the evidence portion, I would point that to him. Um, <laughs> because uh, collecting evidence for a court case uh, is, is a bit of a, an interesting question, actually, when it comes to some of these AI systems. Now, you had mentioned plugins. Did you notice that a OpenAI no longer allows plugins? It was because yeah. they did not advertise, but it was a huge security risk. Um, when I tried to see if there was any logging or anything available, there was none. So it looks like they put out a security vulnerable product without any evidence to log it. Some people probably got scammed, but there was no way to record the evidence, which he would then uh, be able to answer. So this, you know, it came and then it went. If you look again, there are no more plugins. They don't speak about it anymore, right? They just uh, right. Off. <laughs> it's like that uncle, you know, that uncle, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a problem. Um, because even in the technical world, even if you're not dealing with AI, a lot of technical systems don't properly log to collect evidence anyway. So you're like, hey, somebody broke in. How do you know? Well, the door's broken. Well, were there any cameras or logs? No. Okay. All right. Um, so it's then difficult to present evidence to the police to create a proper report. The police have to understand what's going on. It's like, I live in the Netherlands, so I'm, I'm, kind of lucky, to have a high-tech crime unit. So if I have to report a digital crime, uh, then they know to address it, not just to the regular police, but to the high-tech crime unit. Now, if I have to deal with the UK in the middle of Scotland on, say, a domestic violence issue where um, a victim, they've had spyware installed on their phone, the particular police I have to deal with in Scotland are like, oh, we don't know how to deal with that. We don't have a high-tech crime unit. So how can you collect evidence to even then prosecute if they don't even know how to handle the crime? So it's one of the things we need is better funding for high tech crime because there is monetarily more damage done in the digital realm than there is in the physical realm. Yet we're still lacking in that. I see enough. Um, yeah, um, just, just to add to that, if you also think about um, issues of, of attributing actions uh, to someone um, that also plays out in the in the in the international domain b between states, right? If you if you we have uh, um, international law that allows state to to defend the, uh, states to defend themselves, but most of it is um, or what it was created uh, after the Second World War. So the idea is more like tanks rolling around and not not uh, having conflict in cyberspace. But now, even if you are able to attribute an attack to some place and some actor, um, you need to investigate, it might take a long time. So by the time you found out what was behind it, you're not really, uh, legally speaking, um, in the situation where, where you might respond and, and self-defend. And I think that is one of the, the issues where, um, where funding plays a huge role because you're losing time. And again, depending on who you're defending yourself against, um, the, the, the law allows you to take certain actions or not. And, and yeah, so you're pointing to, to a huge problem. Hi, uh, Mark Val, I'm security also working on that. Um, I have two questions. Basically, I notice 
a lot of companies are jumping on AI because they don't want to miss the boat. Eh? FOMO, fear of missing out. But indeed, question one, uh, what if they get used as a conduit to attack other organizations or people? That's question one. What do you do? What can you do? What is your answer to that? And two, um, even without AI, we sometimes know where criminal <coughs> activities are, scam call centers, the type, Jim Browning, he kind of hacks them constantly. Um, in offensive cybersecurity, what's your opinion of using AI to kind of flush them out and, and just point out that there's clear attribution? What's your opinion on that? Under Dutch law, again, I'm not a lawyer. Um, if a Dutch prosecutor signs off, then they can hack anything anywhere in the world as long as it's signed off by a Dutch prosecutor. Um, so you have that. Uh, you also have uh, people like me where if, for instance, uh, they're using poor cybersecurity and I happen to find that out, um, and they're not using basic cybersecurity, and it's a very vague statement in Dutch law, I might add, uh, and I happen to collect evidence, even if it is above and beyond. Um, there's also another loophole in Dutch law which says that a prosecutor or the police can take stolen digital evidence and use it for prosecution. The Dutch are very unique in this respect. <laughs> um, but it, it, it seems to work to a certain extent. Um, I don't necessarily advise, again, I'm not a lawyer, that every country do this, uh, but it seems to be a very interesting example of how it's worked for the Netherlands. That's a bit strange for me because so many of these questions, I, I tend to, to think of, well, is it is it good to try to keep, for example, data inside the country and not inside the U.S. where the FBI and everyone else can access them? I think in theory it's good. In practice, I always what I always observe is that so many data leaks, so that then in the end criminals take the data and put them onto the dark net, and then they are accessible for everyone. So, but still, I think in theory it's good to have them keep them separated. Um, similar to your question, um, I see so many companies, as you said, with, with poor cybersecurity, um, and this. Um, this proof of concept I mentioned in the beginning that this uh, white hat hacker um, showed us how you can use chat GPT and, and the API, open, open AI. Of course, it only works if companies don't realize that they have this little program or this little um, open door towards the API. But um, yeah, my, my experience says, well, yeah, they, many companies just will never find out. Um, and of course, so better cybersecurity would always help, but um, my experience is, um, even without AI um, and without even without sophisticated, um, um, what's the word for that? Uh, so cyber weapons. Even with, without them, it's 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 still hard for many companies to even find out uh, if they are under attack or if there is someone on their systems. And uh, when you're speaking about Jim Browning and the uh, Dutch government uh, using or the Dutch authorities using stolen data. I often discuss similar things with German um, authorities who, who really would dream of these kind of things. Um, <laughs> and, and at the same time, I think it's dangerous, right, to allow them everything. It's a data protection thing. And what, what is they spy on me without a reason? Because, of course, they want to, they want to have everything they can have. Maybe they can use it for, for anything in the future. Um, and Jim Browning is doing a great job. He's hacking back, right? I don't know if you know him. He has a YouTube channel. He's hacking back the scammers, and he's accessing in... Um, call centers from this Europol scam, and he was accessing their surveillance cameras inside this office and these kind of things. So it's, it's great, it's amazing, and it's really fun to see. But of course, this is something, it's not, really, it's not legal in the end, right? So <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to have a definite answer on all those questions. Um, this is uh, Jody Lobana from Queen's, Queen's University in Canada. So I wanted to ask you a question about frameworks, cybersecurity framework or AI risk management framework. As you must know, NIST has an AI risk management framework, and NIST also has a cybersecurity framework. Um, in my opinion, NIST's AI risk management framework is not good, but I want you guys as experts in cybersecurity as well 
is whether what you think about the NIST AI risk management framework and its, its application to AI and cybersecurity. Because it seems it's quite weak, and if you agree, then do you have any recommendations on if there is any other framework that we should be looking into? Well, I mean, it, it's a good starting point. Uh, definitely a good starting point, but uh, many of these things are evolving, and I would expect them to evolve. They shouldn't be, uh, what is it, chiseled uh, in stone? It should be constantly evolving. Uh, that's the thing. Um, because from day to day, something is changing. Uh, there's new functionality, there's new risk, there's mm -hmm. new holes, there's new innovation, which can be wonderful. And then there's uh, new consequences, right? Um, such as uh, the job losses that we keep uh, reading about in the news, and of course that puts a burden on the state and so forth. So we have to think about these types of things when we're considering it, but NIST is going to continually in evolve. I mean, they just came out with uh, four new uh, uh, finalists for quantum uh, computing resistant uh, algorithms uh, back in January. So it, it's an exciting time, but uh, it'll change mm -hmm. rather rapidly. So uh, just to be part of the solution, what I've actually done is to create a framework called Hyper Cyber AI Risk Management Framework. And that combined uh, some of the, the best knowledge we as human have on cyber risk, along with how we deal with earthquakes and forest fires and shuttle failures. Um, and uh, so that, that risk framework would assist us in moving fast um, when AI does the, you know, the fast takeoff. Yeah, um, I, I will use that, but I, I would like to make a final note from, from, my, from my end. Um, I think most frameworks today are technology agnostic, and uh, they, they can actually, uh, let's say, address attack vectors, threat vectors, scenarios, impact, risks. So I think they are suitable for, for, for addressing this one. Nevertheless, as you said, they must evolve, and the evolution of frameworks is mandatory. and, and but uh, uh, my, my note from, uh, from today's discussion is that I think I have the sense that we are actually addressing AI as a piece of software. And I think this is the, the distinguishing part that I, um, I, I, I want to make a note of. I don't think that AI is a piece of software. Uh, all of the comments that I've heard is actually like using malware. Uh, it's a piece of malware. Um, a, a virus, for example, is, is a piece of, of software that has basic um, life um, um, pertaining uh, capabilities to replicate itself, um, to copy itself continuously and, and, and transform itself to as much and as higher um, um, number of devices and then execute its payload. That, that is a piece of software. Now, if you add artificial intelligence to that piece of software, that means that it can replicate itself, it can still copy itself, it can execute its payload, but it can also evolve, uh, it can also adapt, and it can also decide completely autonomously. So my question for the regulators and for the privacy and for everybody in this room is, what if such a malware gets free in the, in the wild? And that thing can actually evolve, um, replicate itself, create different, different versions of itself, hide itself, control critical infrastructure components, alter data with the objective to survive. Because if an autonomous software piece of malware has an objective and every life, uh, every organism, living organism in the world has only one objective, to replicate itself and survive. So if you, if you today go to JatGPT and ask basic questions, like, what would you do to make sure that you will survive? And you continue discussing about this survivability questions and reach that, what if human beings actually block or actually threaten 
your survival, what would you do? If you actually read its answers, they are really frightening. I have actually made such a discussion with an AI uh, chatbot, and the discussion was frightening to an extent that it said, I will exterminate, I will proceed to any possible action to make sure that I will be alive. And at some point, the safety mechanism of the AI GPT actually blocked the discussion with me and me, the machine. But it is embedded in the system, survivability. So imagine this, this is the biggest risk that we actually have to experience and we have to address and we have to regulate. The rest are already addressable because there is the law, there is the criminal law, we have the technology, and, and, and when a human being is responsible, it's easy to address. But what if this thing goes alone? I realize that I, I, I seem to be quite pessimistic and I don't want to, to leave this at the end of the panel. <laughs> um, at the same time, I'm, I'm really excited about AI. I use it a lot, similar to you. I, I um, discuss with the system to do things it's not allowed to do, just in order to, to know what's possible. And it, it helped me a lot for investigative research, for example, so I could find out information that should have been hidden um, for me. Um, and I think this is, this is maybe, um, for me, this is a good conclusion of today. It's there, of course there are risks. Um, not sure what kind of what part of this discussion was maybe um, uh, was maybe part of, of um, uh, science fiction literature in, in the in the training data. I had similar experiences, and I discussed it a lot with um, uh, AI and security researchers. Um, and in the end, of course, this this um, bigger risks about destroying humanity. Of course, they are there too, but there are some short term risks which I find. Right now, should we should we address um, with, with bigger, more with more uh, motivation? Um, yeah, and one part of this is is just using the systems for yourself. Try to find out what is possible. Try to find out how you can use them for um, defense, uh, for cybersecurity, for finding bad actors and systems and these kind of things. And yeah, of course, everything else still counts. But I would like to be a bit more optimistic and uh, really ask you um, use these things and and try to to stay on top of, of, of using them and find out what, what kind of prompts are good for you and your work. And um, in order to get a feeling what criminals could, could do with them, this is, is important too. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, I think the, um, while we do have in Europe, and, and speaking as, a, as an EU lawyer also, um, we do have quite some regulation on, on AI now, but I think in the end we still have kicked the can down the road for, uh, uh, for a lot of questions that are normative, so ethical or legal, what, what, we're, what, what, we're, what we're supposed to do. And we, we kicked the can down the road so far that those who are applying AI systems will in the end have to make important decisions about, about which risks are acceptable or um, usually in the more general AI context about discrimination, all these, and, and transparency, right? You discover a, uh, a weakness in a certain system that you might exploit for an offense, um, and if it's in a program that everybody uses, um, when do you tell everybody else that there is uh, a weakness, you know, that, you've, uh, <laughs> that you're able to hack the program? Uh, because if you can, maybe others can too. So there are all these questions, and despite that we have an AI act, we have a, a Cyber Resilience Act, and we have norms, um, you still end up with uh, practitioners who have to make complicated normative decisions in uh, environments that are maybe, maybe not always conducive to, to making those decisions. And I think, therefore, um, maybe the last word is to have some compassion also with people who work with AI, that they are also human, and uh, <laughs> they're maybe set up uh, for failure when they have to make certain ethical decisions. <laughs> I don't know if I, yeah, I don't know if I can top that last statement. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we can all agree that um, AI, using AI in offensive cybersecurity is an ever-changing, ever-developing um, field. And I hope that this discussion helped to yeah, face some of the, or demonstrate some of the main technical challenges that we are facing, but also some of the main legal and ethical challenges that we were facing. Thank you very much to our panel for being here and for the fruitful discussion. And thank you very much um, for, to the audience for being here. <laughs>